Welcome to another edition of Antique Radio Archaeology. Today we're going to begin a restoration on a 1948 Westinghouse H204A radio. Now this is an AM FM radio uh, obviously built in 1948. This radio was sent to me by a man named Mike Donaldson who is a fellow veteran. Uh, he came into the Marines uh, a little bit before I joined the Air Force back in the late 70s and he has been a radio restorer for many many years. His dad owned an electronics company of some type. He uh, was able to restore one of these many many years ago. It was ivory in color. These things do come in different colors and he really liked the radio and uh, that thing was a well-playing radio he had it for many years and then when one of his friends in the marines had retired he gifted him that radio and he's always wanted one ever since well he was able to find this one at a local goodwill there in illinois and when he picked this thing up his intent was to restore it and make it an ivory uh, version of this. Unfortunately he ran into some medical issues so he reached out on our radio forums and, and asked for some help and I contacted him and said you know you send me the radio I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, do what you need done with it. So that's where we're at. Uh, he went ahead and sent this to me. Here it is. He uh, got it here in one piece and I'm going to basically go through the radio. Uh, I know I need to recap it. Obviously we're going to repaint the, the case to the ivory color that he would like it to be. Uh, this thing came in three colors. It was in brown, which is this color, an ivory, and I believe it's kind of a light green. I've, I've never seen the green version of it. Definitely replace the electrolytics and uh, and you know tune the thing up and get her working again. Now what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the differences between this and other models. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay so there are four main variations of this style of radio from Westinghouse. This came out in about 1947 and this is the H182. The H182 has the biggest difference between the rest in that it uses a tube type rectifier instead of a selenium rectifier. And this only came in a brown bakelite and it does not have that decorative front cover over the grill. The H202 which came out a little bit later does not have that decorative front cover but this does have the selenium rectifier. And this came in this brown bakelite, but it also came in an ivory color. The H204 is similar to the H202, but it does have that decorative front cover. And it came in three different colors. You could get this in the brown bakelite. You can get it in a ivory color and also that what they call a teal green which looks more blue. Uh, as a matter of fact I also have an example of the teal which is right here and as you can see it doesn't look very green but it is uh, definitely a kind of a bluish tint but teal is kind of a cross between blue and green so I, I guess that's where they got it and the H204A, which is what Mike Donaldson has, is almost identical with the exception of it uses a high impedance antenna instead of a low impedance antenna. And so the circuitry in the antenna circuit is a little bit different, but it also came in three different colors and it has this front decorative grill. And uh, one thing that uh, I will note is the ones that came with the decorative grill also have gold lettering on the knobs. So, But those are the, the cosmetic slash 
uh, electrical differences now. There's different tr chassis types, but uh, I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, I'll do that in some later videos. But uh, those are the main differences between the four uh, models of this H series of radios. So let's, uh, uh, this thing comes apart pretty easy. Knobs just pull off. Ah, nice. I actually have some of those so I can replace that one. Now the the back or the bottom here has four screws. So the chassis is out. Get these other little bits and pieces off of here. Okay. There we have it. So, that is everything off of here except for this. And this is going to stay. This is riveted on. So, that's ready to... Sand it down and paint it. You buy these real cheap. They're just some little cheap uh, brush here. Okay, so I got some scratches and blemishes here that I'd like to get rid of. Uh, so I'm going to use some 600 grit sandpaper and just try to knock some of that down.
So, all right, so I'm about ready to get started with the paint. Uh, let me explain a little bit about what's going on here. This is actually uh, January, and uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit. Uh, I'm just uh, putting some acetone on here to get rid of any fingerprints or anything that I may have put on it. I'm handling this, but uh, it's January, and it's actually about 50. I'd say it's probably about 55 degrees right now which is really kind of warm, but it's not going to last. Uh, we're, we've got snow coming this weekend in a couple of days, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and unfortunately it's a little bit breezy, so that's why I'm on this under my uh, sunroom overhang, where hopefully I won't get any leaves or anything falling down on it. Okay, this is a cloth this will get up any remaining dust. The next thing I'd like to do is I need to get this grill off of here because I want to scrub this down and repaint it. So uh, it's just it's melted on plastic on the back here. So it's just a matter of busting that up and getting it to come out of there. leave enough plastic so I can remelt it later. All right. 
pretty much did it. Alright, so cut that off of there. Now I can clean this up a bit. I have to re glue it to that. And now I can clean this up. this off and uh, dry it off and get some paint on it. So I'm going to go ahead and clean up this cloth a little bit. Uh, this, I'm not sure what it's made of. It's kind of a plastic of a very pliable plastic almost kind of like the, the the insulation on wires so um, it should be pretty easy to clean up here I'm going to go ahead and get some cleaner in here I'm going to go ahead and rinse that out and let her sit and dry out and then we can glue her back to the uh, the backer board. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of spray adhesive on here and then we're going to set this on top of there. So. got this ready to go. Just going to go ahead and pop this thing back on here. There we go. Alright, so these are little nubs. Now what I've got here is a wood burning tool. I'm going to just go ahead and We can mash those down again. There we go. One. Two. Three. Four. All right. And that should hold it. Before I put a coat of wax on this, I'm going to go ahead, this is the label that I printed up, uh, that I uh, went ahead and redid, and, and it's printed on cardstock. I'm going to go ahead and put some adhesive on the back and go ahead and attach it.
And now I'm just going to put a light coat of wax on it. I just want to protect the finish a little. I'd like to interrupt this video for a public service announcement. Now, as you heard just a few seconds ago, there was a telephone ringing in the background, and I went ahead and shut off the video and took the call. Well, <laughs> when I was editing this video and that phone call came up, I was just, just blown away. And here's why. Turns out that was my mom calling. Uh, she calls a lot. Uh, she always uh, <laughs> always just wanted to talk and, and it turns out we wound up having a very pleasant conversation about an hour or so. Uh, I told her about this radio restoration I was doing, told her where I was at on it and uh, she told me about things going on at home and as it turns out uh, about three days later she went into the emergency room with respiratory failure. A week after that, she passed away from COVID. So, here's my public service announcement. You just never know. Never know what life's going to throw at you. I could have opted not to take that call. Maybe I could have called her back later. Who knows? But I am so glad that I took that call and had that opportunity to have that last candid conversation I would ever have with my mom because subsequent conversations were about medical things. So don't ever take life for granted. That's my message. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get back to our regularly scheduled video. The dial face is going to go back in and then the uh, speaker grill. This just clips in. Right. That's in place. Now we need to go ahead and put this in place. Before I put this uh, dial face in here, I cut out some little felt strips just to protect the dial glass. Set this in here. All right. There you have it. 
What I'd like to do right now is I'd like to go ahead and fire this thing up just to sh show everybody that it does work before I start swapping out components in it and uh, cleaning it up. But before I get into that, I just want to explain something about these radios from this generation of radios. A lot of these have what's called a hot chassis. If you notice that the radio itself was enclosed in the Bakelite box and it has this cover on the back and everything was contained so that you're actually not able to touch the chassis while the, the radio is in operation. There's a reason behind that and that is because the power plug which is which goes into this little socket here one pin on this is real close to a short to this chassis there's a resistor in there and a capacitor I think but basically it's just a couple of ohms from that pin to the chassis and that's enough to allow the voltage coming from the power outlet to energize the chassis. Now it doesn't matter if the chassis is energized or if the neutral from the power outlet is on the chassis in which it's not energized. The components in this radio are designed to work either way. So that wasn't a concern back then and plugs back then did not have this wide prong on it. They only had narrow prongs so you can plug it into the socket either way even the sockets didn't have a wide narrow so what happened was pretty much you know you can imagine about 50 percent of the time you have a hot chassis 50 percent of the time you don't now when i say hot chassis all i'm saying is there's voltage on the chassis itself it doesn't mean that it'll kill you a lot of times there's not enough current on the chassis that it can but there's always that slim chance that it could and if it could then you know it, it's dangerous you don't need to be touching a, a chassis with voltage on it because you don't know what the situation is you could be grounded in a way that allows a current path through your heart stops your heart you're dead so it's better to just not deal with putting voltage on this chassis. Now the way you do that is to use a polarized plug and to make sure the pin on here that ties to the chassis is tied to the neutral not the hot on the uh, power plug. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to take this ohm meter here we're going to figure out which pin here is tied to the chassis. Okay, nothing on the pin on that side. I got about 1.4 ohms on the pin on this side. So I know that this pin is the one tied to chassis. So what I want to do is I want my neutral on this plug to be plugged into this side because this can go either way. Now, the neutral on a power plug is the wide prong, and on this cord it's this flat edge, which I can show you real quick with the ohmmeter. If I plug into the flat edge and then hit the wide prong, you see it's a short. So that flat edge I want to be on this side when I'm plugging this in. And that will ensure that this chassis is neutral. Now, another thing I would like to explain before I get started is because that's a hot chassis, you don't ever, when you're messing around with these radios, if you plug one in, you don't want these knobs to be off. Because a lot of times these shafts here are tied to the chassis. And if that's the case, then if you touch the shaft without the knob on it, same problem, you're going to get shocked. So, before I get 
to plugging this in, I do want to point out that I'm going to use what's called a dim bulb tester. Now, what the dim bulb tester does is this allows me to bring the radio up without causing damage to the radio if there are problems in the radio. And the way it does that is I have a bulb in series with this outlet. And what this bulb does is when current is drawn through this outlet at a high degree, this bulb will light up. As it lights up, lights up the filament gets hot, it raises the resistance of the circuit to the point where it lowers the voltage, it lowers the current, and it prevents, helps to prevent damage. It's, it, no guarantee that it will, but it, it should prevent damage to the, any of the circuitry in here. So the way you'll know if there's a problem is if I plug this in, turn it on, and that bulb lights up as if I turned on a switch, then I've got a problem. Now there could be, you know, a lot of these radios can have up to 5 amps of current draw, in which case you will see some light on the bulb, but you won't see it light up brilliantly. Um, most of the time you won't see anything. Now this is a 300 watt bulb which has a lower resistance than some bulbs. Now if you use a lower wattage bulb you'll actually have a higher resistance. Now I don't like using lower wattage bulbs because what happens is even with a small amount of current it's going to cause the resistance to um, lower the voltage enough that a lot of times things won't work on the radio. So this is a 300 watt bulb so there's very low resistance. Uh, when you're firing it up. But if there is a problem, it will protect it. So, let's go ahead and uh, hook this up. I don't want to touch anything while I'm firing it up. I'm on AM. I don't have an AM antenna. Now the AM antenna does pass through the FM antenna. So it does act as sort of an antenna, but it's not a very good one. Okay. So I got AM. Ooh. And now it's on that time. And I got you for the sold out show at 204 741 So as you can see, the radio works great. I do the same thing I told you that I never told you I you know that you probably heard that scratchiness in the yeah, hear that? So I do need to clean the pot on this one. Now, okay, so I know it works. Now when I swap out the components, then if anything doesn't work, it's because of something I did. Not because the radio was broke to begin with. Now, one more thing about the dim bulb tester. There is another way of doing this, and that is to use what's called a variac, and I'll reserve that for another uh, uh, episode. But uh, so you can use a variac as well. It just brings up the voltage from a low voltage up to the 110, 120 volts that it needs to to work. So the uh, other thing I wanted to mention is once I've done what I just did, if I'm going to work on this radio, if I'm going to do adjustments on it, if I'm going to tune it up or do anything to it, and I have this chassis out in the open, I want to protect myself. And the way I'm going to do that is use one of these. This is called an isolation transformer. And what it does is it basically isolates me, or isolates the radio, from the ground in this house. It, it eliminates the ground path. So if I happen to touch high voltage on here, yeah, I'm going to get a zap, but it's not going to kill me. <laughs> and that's, that's what's important. So you always use an isolation transformer. Now you want that ground for 
the protection of, of the radio itself and, and uh, you know, to prevent uh, an overload of the circuit, to prevent uh, any fires, you know, damage to the equipment. But once I verify with the dim bulb tester that it works, then I can go to the isolation transformer and work using it. So anyway, that explains that part. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, explain what I'm going to do next here. So what I'd like to do is I am going to swap out all the paper and foil capacitors in this thing. There's one here. This is tied from the AM to the FM antenna. There's one back here. This is part of the antenna circuit. Um, and down below here you have several. <laughs> you got one here, one here, that one is one, here, here, here. All these, now that's an electrolytic, I believe. Yeah, that has a plus and a minus. That is an electrolytic, four microfarads. You got this one, this one. Uh, any of these paper capacitors, I need, there's one down here, there's three, one, two, there's two under here, so there's three there. That one down there. But anyway, all those I want to go ahead and replace. First of all, i got to identify what the uh, capacitance is on each one and the voltage of the capacitor. The way I'm going to do that is with this here. It's called a PhotoFact. Now, in 1946, there's a company called Howard W. Sams who uh, started this business of providing manuals, technical manuals, for radio equipment, uh, later on TVs, um, a lot of electronic equipment uh, throughout the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. And I think they're still in business. I don't know what capacity they produce Photofax anymore, but I do know that they are still in business. But the thing is, they provide a lot of information in these photo facts. If you can get one for your particular radio. Now, it's not going to be on these little one-off radios or these little small companies, but the mainstream, you know, commercial radios, you're going to find photo facts on. Now, these things are really informative. You have, uh, they show you all the layouts of the tubes, the equipment, um, the underneath here, they show you all the components. And each one has a little number or some type of indicator on it, which ties to a chart which will give you all the information you need. Like it will tell you, I do know one of the capacitors I need to replace is a 0 0.005 microfarad 500 volt capacitor. So I can go ahead and figure out what parts I have in the radio that I need to replace, I can go to here, reference it, and I can find out what values I need, and then I can see if I have them in my parts or if I have to order them. Uh, now it also provides things like the dial cord, the tuning cord uh, um, path. Uh, you have all the components, not just capacitors, you have resistors and, and your transformers, and, and then you actual act have an actual schematic of the radio itself, which is very helpful. Uh, it gives you some test point voltages so that you can see what you need when you're troubleshooting the radio. And the best thing is, if you need to do an alignment on the radio, it has the alignment procedures and, and data. And it even shows you some uh, oscilloscope. Uh, patterns that you should be seeing at certain points. So these are very informative. If they have one for your your radio, definitely try to get one because they are just invaluable when trying to troubleshoot and maintain these radios. So uh, what I did is I went ahead and did a little drawing of this chassis and I mapped out which capacitors I need to replace and then I went ahead and referenced them in here and I wrote down all the capacitors that I need and it turns out I need all these capacitors here 
Now, I'm, these are all paper and, and uh, foil capacitors. Don't be fooled by the little lines here. These are not electrolytic capacitors. Therefore, you can use other types of capacitors in here. All that's telling you is which side the outer foil is on. Because sometimes that mattered when, they, when uh, producing these radios because you kind of wanted the outer uh, foil to act as a shield. But with other types of capacitors, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, so with that being said, the only electrolytics I have to worry about. Now this is an electrolytic, I believe. I'll have to look at that better. That somebody used to replace one of the foil capacitors. That is an electrolytic. And on top here, you have this sprag, what they call a multi-section electrolytic. Now, multi-section ele electrolytics are kind of a pain in the butt because they don't make them usually in the values that you need. Uh, what it is, it's three capacitors built into a can. And usually the negative is supplied to the can the positives will hit the terminals down below here and they are marked with little symbols down here so that you know which one is which this one has a 50 microfarad 150 volt capacitor on one turn one lug a 50 volt or 50 microfarad 150 volt on another and then it has a 20 microfarad 25 volt on another now you can always go higher in voltage if you have to replace it but if you use electrolytics you do have to use electrolytics on this and you do have to look, use an electrolytic on this one here but all the rest of these can be replaced with film capacitors or ceramic capacitors whatever uh, I prefer not using ceramics because they sometimes give you um, some issues with the red and, uh, and some bleed over. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if I've got all these in stock. If I do, then we're going to go ahead and start replacing them. So that's pretty much it for now. Let me go ahead and see what I have in stock. So this concludes part one of the Westinghouse H204A series. We still need to replace all the capacitors that I've identified in this part. We need to actually look at the selenium rectifier to determine whether or not we need to replace it. If we do, we're going to put in a modern replacement. And I'll also explain why. We will also be looking at the power plug, which is attached to the back panel. We have to come up with a fix for that. And there's also the situation of cleaning up the radio chassis itself and we've got there's like a, a, a felt uh, background behind the the radio dial that needs to be looked at possibly replaced so if you'd like to see the next episode or any other episodes uh, related to radios then please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so if you liked what you saw today please hit the like button in the meantime happy restorations everybody i hope you have a great day see you next video bye